You're walking in the woods. There's no one around and your phone is dead. Out of the corner of your eye, you spot him. Hello there, my name is Graham and today we're going to be taking a look at the Call of Cthulhu scenario, Satran Chalice, published by Chaosium and written by Matthew Sanderson. I have to say I love this one, it comes with a full bag of tricks to throw at your players as you turn up the temperature from the uncanny to the outright terrifying as you slow boil them to madness. Where it's got a few bumps along the road, I cannot recommend this scenario high enough. For keepers who enjoy playing oddball NPCs and thinking on their feet, the more you run this game, the more you will get out of it as the tricks and traps that you can foist on your player are pretty fun and you'll come up with more and more creative ways to employ them. This one doesn't run too long either and it will excel as a convention game, being able to complete it in 3-4 to four hours so it doesn't outstay its welcome and this tricks definitely don't get stale. The story revolves around Augustus Wayland and his obsession with summoning an archangel using a long and extremely difficult ritual called the Amberline Operation. This ritual failed the first time he tried it and only with the help of a shady antique dealer, Lester Goodman, did Augustus manage to succeed on his second attempt. Summoning an entity called a Shapeless One, Augustus was taken, leaving his daughter to investigate his death, first seeking out Lester Goodman for selling his father the unfathomable lamp and another older version of the text he required. Then she goes and summons the ritual herself to confront it about her father's death. In this third summoning, Veronica, the daughter, laid a trap and even though the shapeless one forced Veronica to kill herself as it searched her mind for the key to be freed, it was imprisoned within the Wayland Manor on her death. Now trapped within, the entity awaits someone to come by and free it from its bindings, having already found the staff to be less than useful. The premise of this scenario is actually a carbon copy of a film called Dark Song and it takes the long-winded approach and twist from that film and puts them into the backstory of this scenario. Where the back end is there, the story itself is interesting and quick paced compared to that film, but I would highly recommend watching it, uh, as does the author and mentions it directly into the scenario. It is very good and it will set the tone and mood it is trying to achieve when you're messing with the players. The buy-in for the players to get pulled into this mess is a simple one compared to the backstory which underlies it. That is, they are on the journey through the Arkham country and they have simply ran out of gas. Lost and with nowhere to go, they are on the look for a phone or a gas station to refuel, wandering up to the Wayland estate. Wandering up to the house, they are going to know something is up as they search for the gas and the phone. But oh man, they have no idea. If you wish, you could start at the car where they break down or run dry and have them choose which way to go and what to leave and take from the vehicle. This will discourage large weapons to be drawn out at awkward times and anything of that nature. Not that it matters in the slightest what they're actually armed with, I just enjoy watching players weigh up what they might regret not taking later. There is a potential problem here if one or more of the investigators does not engage with the plot and chooses not to approach the house and instead makes all sorts of problems for the keeper. Again, mirroring Deadlight, this scenario relies on a lock-in mechanic to force the players to engage and solve it rather than a personal investment. This can be a big problem with some players and they will have a hang-up as it feels like their agency is stripped from them. But uh, this is just one of these things you're going to have to get over and the players will have to just swallow. And this is why I chose to start them entering the grounds of the Wayland estate rather than at the car. But uh, it's a shame because that would have been a nice scene perhaps. Once you have cleared the hurdle of getting them to the Wayland Manor, the fun really begins. Presented with what appears on the surface to be a normal and fairly mundane household in the throes of setting up a party to celebrate the daughter of Veronica's attempt at performing the Amberlin operation. But this is a mere illusion thrown up to draw in the investigators and what they're really looking at is the trapped spirits of the dead 
who occupy this place and are used as puppets by the Shapeless One. Draw them into the illusion, get them comfortable, and then pull the rug out from under their feet. Up in the copula, at the top of the house, the Shapeless One is hiding out of sight, using the dead memories of the servants to recreate a form of celebration about Veronica attempting a new ritual. This is all an illusion and wool that's been pulled over the investigator's eyes and this never happened. It's a complete fiction created by the Shapeless One. Unnerving events will start to pick at the hems of this illusion and soon the investigators are in for a wild ride. It starts small with the investigators probably thrown off by the welcoming and very helpful staff and family. They will get to use the phone which will probably throw them as well and even be shown the garage and search for more gasoline, but to no avail. They are just out of luck. It will seem that they'll have to wait for a pickup from the local shop uh, to get them some gasoline and back to their own car. Here they will see cigars and fires in the hearth burn but give off no smoke and heat. Lights that are on but they have frayed wires that aren't connected and odd little occurrences that the entity cannot fathom. It's almost like an AI trying to be human but it's not got the framing for the actions and it shows itself up with these little nuances that it just can't replicate, like the alcohol being tasteless and the maid cooking dead things in musty, rusted pots. There are plenty of small tells and more that you can add yourself to inform the players about what is going on here, slowly letting it dawn on them that everything is not as it seems. Most of the story is given from Augustus' point of view, uh, playing the host within the lounge, making sure to tell them about the ritual and how proud he is of his daughter for taking it on, pointing out the paintings in the room and having the staff tell them about Veronica's recent great loss that they can't remember who is actually dead, will probably take them to the mausoleum and finding out more about the mother. Getting out into the garden is a good idea to introduce a few new oddities to the investigators as well, and at least someone will go and check the garage for gas, finding nothing but fleeting glances of Mrs Wayland. Now being cast as the demonic torturer by the entity, she will linger around the garden as a casting shadow that follows the group and will later torment everyone within the house. One of the harder tasks you might have in the garden is introducing them to the well. There isn't much reason for them to go over to it and you might want to introduce a, a little trick to get them over there by having one of the family ask the investigators to water for the kitchen. This gives them a reason to go over there and discover what's happening down there and it will also get them into the kitchen to find out those strange happenings as well, cluing them in for definite that something is amiss within this house. I would introduce most of these things quite early on as things were still civil and the players are still likely to play along and engage with the content. Once all goes south they will trust nothing and they will 100% focus on getting out and disengage with most of the clues you wish them to find unless they are directly involved with getting out. So you need to show these options and clues to, that would resolve the problems reasonably early. However, I would bar them from going upstairs at this point. While back in the house, hopefully they'll be having a grand old time with their water tasting whiskies and chatter about a ritual which will hopefully pique their interest and ask for details without too much information. Give them little tidbits here and there, don't give them all in one sort of blurb. Make sure you just hint at things and make them ask the questions. Of course she isn't and all this is fiction and Victoria lies upstairs dead. On top of all these clues about the rituals and the odd goings on in the house, you should be directing the investigators to the lead statues at each cardinal point in the house. The first one being visible through the front lounge window as they approach the property, August's bust will stare out at them oddly enough for them to check it out. These objects are the wards which bind the shapeless one to the house, each one facing a cardinal direction and have a binding ward carved upon it as a rune. The entity itself is unaware of what is actually holding it here and these four statues are it. Each one of these has a puzzle word on it to be solved, spelling out the power word imbued upon them. 
This is one of my least favourite parts of the scenario as it comes as, with a bit of a question as solving the puzzles don't really do very much and is a mere gimmick as far as I can see. They don't activate anything or they don't mess with anything. Knowing the words rather than just knowing that they're words, a fairly meaningless find. With Victoria's journal telling the investigators of what is written on them and the strange markings, that is enough for the investigators to actually trap the entity within them by pushing them together. They don't need to know which one is which. So what I would do is I would give them a bonus dice for figuring out which one is which, spelling it out or announcing it as they push it forward or chanting it even. By the time the doorbell goes for the first guest for the dinner party, the investigators should know a few things. They should know there's a ritual happening or happened in the house to summon an archangel. Uh, they should also know that there's strange ledge objects with symbols on them pointing in carnal directions. And that everything is not quite as it seems. And with that, we can get to the good bit. Lester Goodman. Once you feel they have settled in and think they are going to get uh, a pickup, you can introduce Mr. Lester Goodman, the rare antiquity and book dealer who is an absolutely brilliant character, and hats off for the author for including him. This is one of my favourite scenes uh, to play, and always gets a what the fuck out of the players when it starts to get rolling. Well, this Lester is actually an illusion. The original was an aspect of Narlethotep, giving Augustus the means to complete the ritual just for fun. The Beacon of Chaos, a lantern which would summon the Shapeless One instead of an Archangel, was given to him as well as an accurate version of the text required, and Augustus complied and summoned it from Azazoth's court instead of the Archangel. The Lester we see is a depiction that the entity has from the mind of one of the servants, the butler, as he remembers him, and it's a, more of a fragmented and confusing mess than actually a single person, producing not one Lester Goodman, but a whole bunch of them, as one comes in for dinner, so will another, and then another, and they'll all greet each other and the investigators in turn. This will cause panic as the same person comes in the door again and again and the cat will truly be out of the bag. The investigators will panic and make all efforts to get out the house and away from the house and away from the property and confront the household about what the hell is going on. The investigators should now be corralled into the house as they are invited to dinner and the house starts to get very dark indeed. If any of the players linger in the garden, use the good Mrs. Whelan to harass and badger them until they get inside, although any stubborn ones that want to leave can try to do so, but ultimately find themselves walking around the property and ending up back at the front door. And if that doesn't make them go back in the house, introduce the good old trope, the storm, to push them inside, with the entity making sure that they freeze to death, or think they do at least, if they stay outside. With all the Lester Goodmans and the Waylands having a good old time in the dining room, the player should be advancing to explore the building a little bit more and discover the bodies within. In the basement they can find the staff clutched in their agony and madness as it's played out before them. I would say this one is rarely found but it is a good scene if you can get them down there. The one which is more important though is Victoria upstairs which offers the wand and the journal which is key for them to find out what is going on and how to solve it. Actually it's the, the main clue uh, and if they don't get that they're pretty screwed. I would also introduce the clue 1B here as it's more appropriate for them to find this to solve the problems in amongst her journal rather than just be handed out, figure out that there's a weird puzzle to be solved. It's fairly more organic and the players didn't bat an eye at that happening where they did if it was handed to them where they first saw the bust. You should be stepping up the action at this point, using Mrs. Whelan to murder everyone in sight as her fetid nails and claws guts people and rip out their throats for daring to question the existence of the reality that's shown to them. Resetting them so they're fresh as daisies and they'll just go on about their day, stepping over their own dead corpse. She can be banished with her own ritual, but generally I think this is confusing things as they all think this is what will end the house trap rather than just banish her, and it will feel a bit of an anti-climax rather than having her as a, a two-bit villain. 
being used by the entity. So I cut it out completely, but if you want to still include it, keep it in there and have her hanging around until she is banished. But I like to focus on the bad boy upstairs and Mrs. Wayland should only come out to play every so often to right things when they are wrong. By this point they should be heading upstairs and they should find that body of Veronica's and her diary and make sure everything is in place. At this point they should know that pushing the wards together will banish or trap the entity and bring it out into the open. As they push them together, bring the entity into visual view as it's trapped inside these things and would be pulled into the centre of it. There is overly long and expansive information about the book and the process of the ritual, but when it comes right down to the brass tacks, it doesn't need to be shown and it doesn't really need to be used, unless your group revels in that sort of fidelity of detail. One of the things I don't like to see in scenarios is jargon, and this is basically a massive dump of theology, which a lot of players will be turned off with as soon as you start talking about these things and mentioning things they don't understand or don't care about. They they'll turn off and that'll be the end of it. You don't need to show this and keep it in the background if it's needed. If someone asks a question, answer it and give them that information, but don't feel you need to give out all this information and it mostly can be just ignored. When it comes right down to it, breaking the four wards or pushing them together are the two main avenues of beating this module. Both result in the entity being spirited away either banished back to Azazoth's court for pushing them together, where it can be summoned again by someone else, or setting it free by destroying the ward, letting it loose to torment humanity for trapping it for so long. It's a bit like an angry cat really as it lashes out, despite you trying to help it at times, and even pushing it back to its court is not really that bad a thing. So I'm not sure it should be attacking people here, but uh, it wants to harass humanity, so keep with that. A small problem here is the entity is nails. If it has the ability to show the investigators what it wants due to power 200, they literally cannot overcome it individually, and only with the power of friendship can it be defeated. The entity could simply change the wards into something the investigators hate or wish to t attack and kill once it knows what they are, leaving them unable to push them together and having no choice but to break the seals. But it's a bit of a dick move, it's just one of the options it probably has available due to its skill set, but hey, it's got a lot cooler tricks up of its cosmic dress to show the investigators, and pushing those wards together can and will result in a lot of total party kills. So heads up, you might want to tone this one down a bit, as it's a bit of a beast. The investigators will have to combine their power, stacking it against the entity's 200 to do so, making the one player roll off against it. I hid this mechanic by making everyone roll, but only one of the rolls actually counted, and that was the person with the highest pow. So it made everyone feel a bit more inclusive in the actual final pitch battle. But it does come down to one player, and it really was quite a sad day, as my second group just couldn't beat it, even with five investigators, each of them having quite a low power, and resulting in the attacks of the entity using its 100% hit inflict madness, which made them see Azazos court and it sent them to the ground driveling like fools as they lost 1d100 sanity. If you wish to pad this blow you can go for the steel memories instead, taking 3d10 intelligence off them instead for their efforts and this will give them a second chance if they fail, so they won't be drooling idiots on the ground after just one attempt. But I would give the entity a little bit more motivation here to offer them some sort of uh, benefit for breaking the barriers and sweetening the deal so it can go free and harass the world. If not, they'll have to just send it home and it will fight and kick for all it's worth, even though it should be fine with that, but it just isn't. With all said and done, it's one hell of a ride, well-paced, disturbing, crazy, weird, horrific, and lethal as 
any Call of Cthulhu scenario should be. This one is a keeper and I loved running it with a slew of great NPCs and some nice tips to go along with the tricks. It is a playground for any keeper to mess with your poor investigators. With only a few plot holes that are hidden in the back end, we can eat under proper scrutiny, but they're hell of a hidden and they shouldn't cause more of any problems unless you bring them up in the first place. All in all, what's not to love, this one will most likely see my 2021 top 10 list and it makes the scenario book Deadlight and Other Dark Turns an absolute steal at its cost and a must buy for any Call of Cthulhu lover. I really like this uh, very short little scenario book. And with that, if you enjoyed this content, please do like, share and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I shall see you again next time. His head topples to the floor, expressionless. You fall to your knees and catch your breath. You're finally safe.